Seems to me like things are set up to make me fail tonight. <laughs> you get into a feast like we just had, oh, then come in here and put me on. Wow. I'll tell you what. I recognize the diffuser at the entrance, and I know how those things work because we're big essential oil. Well, my wife is really into essential oils. Uh, so I know you can put stuff in that thing to make us all peppy and, and everything else. So I don't know if you've done that yet or not. The other thing, I, I'm just so glad because Levi, last night, uh, he gave me an out for whatever happens about to happen here. Because uh, he said, and I'm taking this one with me back to Monument, Colorado. He said, listen, uh, you know, uh, lousy preaching can be saved by great singing. And the singing's been great. So let's remember that uh, right now. So we're going to get into it. I was so thrilled a few months back, whenever it was, that I was contacted that you were all planning this, this uh, 2018 first annual Tri-States Healthy Churches Workshop. And the moment that I heard what it was about, uh, I just said, oh, I prayed a prayer. I said, God, please let my schedule be available to come and be part of this. Uh, I have a very busy schedule. Uh, I'm a, uh, active, been many years in the Air Force uh, athletics. I'm an announcer, a PA announcer for sports like soccer and baseball and lacrosse and uh, have done some swimming and a basketball game and all kinds of things. So I thought, oh, that's right in the middle of things. And so I didn't know what the schedule was going to be. And so I told uh, Mike uh, Weber, I said, listen, Man, if I, if I can, I will be there. But I'm not going to know in a month until they release the official schedule that I have a contract to, to take care of. And so uh, we got that schedule and I looked and it was just devastating because they're playing UNLV, uh, the baseball. Uh, and a three-game series started yesterday. But I'm here, so something happened. And I will tell you, it is a God thing. Uh, I had a call from my event manager, said, listen, uh, just to let you know on this schedule we just sent you, uh, on this particular weekend we have a guy who does uh, announcing that is going to do a baseball tournament for the NCAA in a different region than what we do. And he hasn't done it for a while, and so he asked if he could come up and just practice a couple of games. And he said, how about this weekend? that he would do it, and I said, amen, amen. So here I am, uh, and, and thrilled to be here. I heard the theme, uh, the, the uh, Tri-States Healthy Churches Workshop. Uh, I was concerned at first. I said, healthy churches, will there be anybody there? Uh, I wonder what they have planned out there in Goodland, Kansas, with what you hear anymore going on uh, in the church and stuff, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit. What a perfect theme, the book of Acts. Uh, great, great start and a great place to park. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to start there tonight. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, I call it the journey of the now what with God's people. They were on a lot of those journeys, by the way. Of what is going to happen next? Imagine a group of, of about 120 uh, gathered in a room, and they had just gone through some of the most devastating experiences, the most unreal things. Imagine them sitting there, totally devastated, totally confused and dazed, and even lost. Everything, everything that they thought would happen didn't happen. Everything that they hoped would happen didn't happen. Everything that they were promised would happen according to their interpretation didn't happen. They were all in. They devoted everything, every single thing to this guy, this man, named Jesus, who came through town and just started talking about what God had promised. And somehow he convinced them that he was going to be the king. They bought it. And they went all in. 
They left everything to follow this guy named Jesus. All the way to the end, and, and they're in this garden, and the next thing they know, the, the soldiers are coming, and, and Jesus, instead of fighting, turns around and lets them tie him up and lead him away. They ran. Because everything, everything that they thought would happen didn't happen. So here they are in this room and they're just beyond devastated. Jesus had gave some indication because as we know, uh, he was raised from the dead and he appeared to them and he told them, he said, listen, I know you want to run, but I'm telling you, stay put. Just stay put. My father, my father has a gift for you. And he's going to give you this gift. And then he indicated, he said, this gift is the most amazing gift that you can imagine. It's one that he promised. He says, you know, it, it, it's, it's linked to what you already know some of. He says, you know, John's baptism of repentance and the like, he said, my father has a gift. Where the baptism will be with the Holy Spirit. And I can imagine them saying, but the Holy what? The Holy Spirit. A gift from my Father. And then the people, as, as they heard it, of course, being people, they looked to Jesus and they said, Oh, we're back. This is good. Great. So now... You're going to be the king that we expected, right? Now you're going to establish the kingdom where we can rule, right? And Jesus says, you people. Well, that's my translation. You people. Just stay put. Just stay put. My father has a gift for you. So they stay put. The day of Pentecost comes. has been talked about. The Holy Spirit is given. In such an incredible way. And the people are experiencing this and it's so new to them. But, but now what? It's another now what? So Peter takes the opportunity, he stands up and he preaches. And he gives them the news that we've talked about earlier today. He says, listen, this Jesus whom you crucified, he's Lord. He's your Messiah. He's your king. And he gave this message and, and the people's hearts were pricked. And, and Peter finishes by saying, listen, this is what you do. You, it's something new. You, you be baptized, but you're going to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of your sins. And you're going to receive the gift of my father. The gift that you just saw demonstrated, my Father is going to give you with your decision of faith to believe. To believe that I am His Son and that I came to die for you. Jesus is, is, is preached and the people, as I say, they dove into the water, over 3,000 of them, and, and, and got up. And, and, and then comes the question again, okay, the next level, now what? Well, now what? What are we going to do next? And that's what we've been focusing on here uh, this entire day. The challenge goes to the apostles, the leaders. The challenge goes to them in how they are to lead and how they are to teach the now what. To answer the question for the people. And so in the text for the final time today, Acts chapter 2, we get the insights into the now what. That they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Some translation, awe came upon every soul. And everyone saw the many wonders and the miraculous signs that were done by the apostles. 
And all the believers were together, had everything in common, selling their possession and goods. They gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Healthy churches. How do you know? How do you know if you're part of a healthy church? Well, tonight I come, especially because of this theme, and I say, I, I look at one thing. What is the awe level of the church that you're a part of? What is the awe level? And well, what is awe? Well, we define awe. Awe is a, a feeling of respect or reverence mixed with dread and wonder. Some translations said that they were, were filled with fear. But awe, a, a respect, a reverence mixed with dread and wonder, often inspired by something majestic or powerful. Broken down, it says it is overwhelming wonder. So I ask tonight a thought to think about as we begin. When, when was the last time you were overwhelmed with wonder over something? Whatever it might be. Overwhelmed with wonder. This past week, my wife and I sat down with our tax accountant to do our taxes. I confess to you, I was overwhelmed, but it was not with amazement and wonder. It was dread and fear. <clears throat> when was the last time you were overwhelmed with wonder about something good? That's awe. Awe. When was the last time you were in awe? When I, when I think about it, it's... How about last night when we began? Singing songs of praise and learning how to sing songs of praise and praise to our incredible God. Did you experience any awe in the songs we sing? Were you overwhelmed? Overwhelmed with wonder? Because you acknowledge and you realize who it is you're singing to and what he did for you. Awe came upon every soul. Every soul. It says that they had glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And I just have to ask every time I read that, is that really possible in the church that you're going to enjoy the favor of all the people? Uh, we, we, someone had alluded to, to it earlier, but uh, yeah, I'm just reminded so much of, of the saying, you know, that goes, you know, to, to live above with the saints we love. Oh, that will be glory. To live below with the saints we know. Now that's another story. They enjoyed the favor of all the people? Is that possible? Well, I tell you tonight, it's very possible. In fact, it's easy as pie if you are filled with awe when you're gathered with them. Overwhelming wonder and amazement. And even I'm guilty. I will confess in all of my transparent self that, that I've used many times, depending on how difficult my week has been as a minister with people, to end a sermon and say, okay, listen, just remember God loves you and I'm working on it. So keep that in mind. <coughs> Overwhelmed with awe. Awe came upon every soul soul, overwhelming wonder and amazement. And all the people, it says, all the people enjoyed the favor of one another. My Lord. 
Hmm. And you know what? They had no idea what was coming. They were, they were filled with awe, overwhelmed with wonder and amazement. Little did they know that everything was about to be changed again on their journey. Little did they know that very soon, very soon, they would be punished because of their beliefs. Very soon, they would become targets because of their beliefs in this guy named Jesus. Very soon, they would be killed, many of them, because of their beliefs in this guy named Jesus. And very soon, little did they know, Acts chapter 8, a great emphasis, great persecution would break out against the church. And they would be scattered. They would run for their lives out of Jerusalem. All, all except the apostles. Running. Afraid. Confused. Dazed. Now what? Now what? As they continued, because now, no longer are they going to be sitting at the feet every day of the apostles. The apostles stayed. Church is on their own. What are they going to do? They had some teaching, obviously. What are they going to do now? Now what? We gather here tonight and we know exactly what happens next. We have the blessing of being able to read the story. They had no idea. We read the story and we know exactly what God's plan was for His people all the way up to tonight with each of us gathered in awe of the living God. We know exactly what's going to happen and why. The Spirit of the living God overflowing in this place. Can you sense it? Can you feel it? Uh, last night, were you telling the truth when you proclaimed? And I heard most every one of you were singing. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. That's what we sang. Are you in awe? Were you in awe when you sang that song, acknowledging, saying, oh, wow, the Spirit is here. Well, what does that mean? The Spirit is here. Healthy church, you want to know, I say, answer one question, what is the awe level whenever you gather where you gather? And I don't care what day, what night it is. It can be a Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Monday, small group, Bible study group, Thursday, Friday, whenever you gather. Are you in awe because you know the Holy Spirit is there? That's what it was in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit was in that place. And now the Holy Spirit is in this place. They were filled in awe in Acts chapter 2. What are we filled with tonight? Realizing it's the same Spirit. The same Spirit. Are you emotionally, I mean, where are you in your level of amazement? I... As I consider and, and look in deeper to the text, I'll tell you, even uh, to think of awe and the level, how do you tell? Well, every church, I believe, filled with awe, should be filled with awe-amazing stories. You have awe-amazing stories where you're from. Amazing stories of what God has done, and there's only one explanation as to what was done, and it is God. 
amazing stories. Uh, just coming back to this place, I will tell you. Some of you haven't seen in over 10 years. You've aged, for sure. <laughs> I've been shocked with some, but I, no names need to be mentioned. 10 years is a long time. But even coming back to this place and coming through Burlington, that I have so many memories of all amazing things. And remembering and, and, and realizing just how much God has done. Ah, oh, amazing things. Very emotional flashback for me. And maybe some of you don't know my story. I, I'm a, 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 from a pew to a pulpit guy. Uh, no formal education or training. And you say, oh, that explains why <laughs> this guy is. No, from a pew to the pulpit. Now, on my journey in, in Burlington, I, I spent most every Sunday sitting in my pew just minding my business. And then the news came that they were going to be building a prison and the, and the minister there was Monty Pettijohn. And Monty says, listen, once that prison was built, they sent some word out for volunteers from the churches to come and help. And Monty pulls me aside and says, uh, we need to go minister in that prison. And I said, we don't need to go minister. You can go minister. And he goes, we need to go minister in that prison. And I said, we don't need to go minister in that prison. I remember the first night that we went to minister in that prison. <laughs> I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. And so began this journey. And, and we started with this, just a small Bible study that was occasional lifts, one or one, uh, two a month maybe. And, and it, it began, and, and I remember so vividly uh, what I was learning because Monty was the greatest teacher that I've known. Uh, and he was helping me and keeping me calm through those nights. And then a few months went by, and then Monty was called to another church. He's gone. And we had another sit down and Monty said, listen, uh, he told me, he said that I need to continue on with the Bible study by myself. And I said, no, I don't need to continue on with the Bible study. He says, no, Greg, he told me I need to continue. I remember the first night I went into the Bible study by myself. I was terrified. But I went in fully equipped because I had some education behind me now. I had spent some time with some of the Sunset curriculum and with Monty, and the, it was the greatest experience. And I'm prepared now. I've got this. I'm ready. Just turn me loose on them. And I remember going in and sitting down in that room with those inmates and in, in the, the same setting and beginning this study and talking. And within about five minutes, one of them raised their hands and, and asked a question about something that I was proclaiming is just common sense and simple. And they asked something that threw me completely overboard. I was lost. I couldn't answer it. It's like I've been feeling all day today. I feel like a lion in a den of Daniels. That might take a little bit for you all, but I just looked around and thought, oh man. And I remember finishing that, that study and, and headed out to the parking lot and getting into my pickup. And I'll never forget my knees literally shaking. And I'm, I'm asking God, what was that? What happened? Come to find out those fellas in prison, pardon the pun, had nothing but time on their hands. And many of them spent that time digging deeper into the Word of God. Many of them spent their time, all their time, digging deeper into the theological things. I didn't know what theological meant. I had to look it up. And I said, now what? So I continued on and, and had to change my approach and different things. In a couple of months, the, the chaplain pulled me aside and said, Greg, he said, listen, uh, we'd like to, if possible, for you to come in and meet the warden would like to meet with you and, and me. We've got some things to discuss. And I said, finally, 
they're on to me. This guy's got no credentials, no qualifications. He's been pulling a scam for about six months. It's time for him to, and I'm just saying, praise the Lord, get me out. I go in and sit down and I said, well, yeah, I'm all right, go ahead. And they said, well, what we've decided is we don't have a Sunday worship service for this, these groups. And we want to start one. And so we, we're, we're going to do that with the preacher. And I said, that's a great idea. They need that. They need their worship service. They need to be in awe of God together as they praise and worship. I said, that is good. I'll be praying. And they said, well, we, we want to ask you if you will be the preacher. And I said, I'm no preacher. Let's get that right. So, no, I'm no preacher. I said, listen, we've sat down with the inmates and we've talked. And your name was the only name that came up. We want you to be our preacher. And I said, I'm no preacher. The first Sunday that I went in to preach, I was terrified. I was trembling. I was shaking in my boots and crying out to God, now what, now what, now what? And over some 10 years just in there alone, the experience, the journey, the awe of the living God saying, I've got this. You just trust in me. I will help you through the fear, the trembling, the shaking knees, the throwing up. I will help you through all of that. You just trust in me and stay with me. It's going to be all right. And I did. Man, did he turn my world upside down and all around. From there, the calling to Burlington or to uh, Monument, uh, Trial Lake Church of Christ up on top of Monument Hill, 7,200 foot altitude. And also involved with the prisons in Canyon City, more prison ministry there. I just loved it. It was the most awe amazing story. So we go to this text and we say that awe came upon every soul as they were gathered there and they experienced the Spirit. Now what? God had poured His Spirit into His church, into every believer, so that they could show the world what the good news looks like, and talks like, and lives like. Show the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. And tonight, the challenge comes to each of us as I remind us, listen, we remain as children of God, as the living, walking, breathing advertisements for Christianity in the world. Everywhere you go, regardless, you're an advertisement for this Christianity that you profess. And what's the message? Is it a message of awe? And when people look and they see in your life and how you're handling all of the stress and all of the disasters and all of these things and they see you, you, you staying strong in your faith and walking through it, do they recognize the awe? Or do they look at you in your advertisement and say, why, why would anyone want to be a part of that? It's a disaster. What is the message that's being sent? Is it a message of awe? Are you the light, Matthew 5 and verse 14, letting your light shine so that people will see your good deeds, your good works, and be led to glorify the Father? Awe. What an awe, amazing story. So now from the now what, I come to the so what. When we gather together, when you gather together back where you're at or where you're from or if you're from here, what is the awe level? Is it overwhelming wonder? I, I ask many times, when it's Sunday morning and you're preparing yourself to load up and to come and to join the family of God, what is the awe level? as you prepare. It is so beyond my grasp to witness what happens a lot of times on Sunday mornings with people coming in. And I know it because I was, I was part of it one time. 
when I had kids. And I remember that Sunday morning, the prep time to be in the presence of God amongst His people with the Spirit overflowing in the place. It began with the screaming and the shouting to the kids, you, you have 15 seconds to get in this car or else, or else. And then all the way to church, I can't believe you weren't in the car. Now we're going to be late and everyone's going to look at us. And this is so terrible and awful. And now what are we going to do? And only to come in the doors while they're singing the song and sit down and not miss a beat. It is well. <laughs> with my soul how do you do that I did it what is the level of awe the level of awe coming in do you know what they used to have to do in the old days hey, you know I'm, I'm a proponent of let's go back because I think it would help many of us who are struggling with the idea that when you come together, the moment that you see another face, there should be a moment of awe. I love you with the love of the Lord. I see in you the glory of my King, the Spirit. What's the awe level? I say maybe we go back to the old to prepare before they would ever come in to do anything before the living God. They had to be baptized. The cleansing pools. How many would you need here to make sure everybody's clean when they come in? We're not talking about the dirt. We're talking spiritually. What would it take? How many? But at least would that not get your mind? You think God might have knew what he was doing when he says, you need to understand and learn the importance of cleanliness before me. Holiness. What would it do? Think about it going back to prepare to know that even tonight when you're sitting here are you filled with awe because everywhere you look you can see evidence and you can feel according to what we sing and you can hear the brush of angels wings and you see glory on each face the level of awe what would it take for us to get our minds focused before we come in together, together, to say, before the living God, oh, amazing. What is God doing through His Spirit in you today to prove that He's God? I love Brent Flanders and what Brent said. He says, God, God is pursuing you. He's pursuing me. We're not pursuing anything. And he wants to work through you, through his spirit, for the purpose of showing the world, not just going around and, and talking about it, but showing the world that he's God. What is he doing through his spirit in you? The awe amazing truth that I have come to understand and experience is that even the faith as small as a mustard seed, God will blow the doors open from heaven and he will give you everything you need. Everything. He will guide you and provide for you to show the world around you that he's in you and he's for real. A mustard seed level of faith. And you can accomplish that with God's help. As I return back here and walk into this place, I am overwhelmed with wonder and awe of what has happened here. Not because of the people, mind you, but because of God. Because I know that it wasn't you that accomplished all this. No way. It was God. And I can say that with confidence because that's my amazing story, too. I've experienced where we are. All of a sudden, things just come together and you get together at the end and you look at this incredible work and you say, how did it happen? I don't know. I don't know. That's the awe, amazing story, being overwhelmed with wonder and awe. But now I ask, even for the folks here, wow, now what? Now what? great place it's a great place I took pictures it's a great place but now what what are you going to do with this blessing 
What's your plans? What's your prayers? I had lunch, a great lunch today with two of your elders, the Mikes. And I asked them, I said, hey, have you thought about a, a dedication service? Dedication on a Sunday, a service, dedication. And I know that that word can send a red flag sometimes. Because it's like, now listen, we're, we're not, it's not about, you know, we don't want to say, look at what we've done. Da, da. No, that's not the dedication service I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind where you get sackcloth and ashes and you repent and you cleanse yourself and you come walking in before the living God that's, that's here in this place and, and, and you bow down and you say, Father, we are dedicating this entire blessing to you. Everything about it is yours. And we are yours. Do with it and do with us what you may that's going to help to convince this community that you're for real. And your son is for real. And we're living proof. Living proof of what the Spirit can do. And they can tell by one look and see the awe upon each and every one of us. Awe was upon every soul. Are you going to erect a stone? Man, that's biblical. Every time God did something awe amazing with his people, what did they do? They said, hey, go get some rocks and make a monument. Put it up. First Samuel 7, remember. Samuel, they defeated the Philistines. The first thing he did, get me some rocks. And he built this, 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 this rock, right? This memorial, and he named it. How do you name a rock? Ebenezer. The Lord is our help. Here I raise my Ebenezer. The Lord is my help. God has done an incredible thing here. Where's the rock? I'm just asking. Just a thought. You do that, but then the question is, oh Lord, now what? My, my dream, my dream, a silly little dream that I've been promoting for many years up at Tri Lakes, and people are starting to catch on. I said, listen, the thing that I'm most concerned about is our presence in the community that we're in. I have this dream that the church should be the center of the community. Remember Little House on the Prairie, anybody? The church is the center of the community. If something terrible happens, everybody get to the church. We got to talk and pray and plan. If somebody needed something in the community, it was let's get to the church. They'll help. They're the center of the community. How about the church where you are? What is it in the community? The, uh, the most scary proposal that I put to make people really think about how important that is, is I said, tell me this. If tomorrow we decided to turn the lights off, lock the doors, and walk away, how long would it take in the community before anybody noticed we were gone? That's a scary thought. The community, being the center of the community with God's spirit. Some things that, that we started immediately up where I'm at is, is the involvement with the local police. We, we have a group that meets every month, cops and clergy. And that's what we do. We find out what the needs are as the church. And we're going to meet those needs. We are dedicated and committed to the program. We are united in that service. And to the point that the chaplain of the police department has taken a special interest in the church where I minister. And, and I'm on her speed dial to where any time there's an emergency or a tragedy, she makes one call. And that's to me to say help. That took time to develop but it's being involved, it's being a part of the community. 
And it's not easy when you get a call telling you, listen, we just had a mom and a wife that, that was killed in a motorcycle wreck, and would you please go, and these two kids and her husband, and yes, we'll be there. We have a, another person who has passed away that, 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 from, the, from the police force, and, and they've got a funeral, but no, no real church. Would you be able to fill in as a church and help them in the process of burying their loved ones? And yes, 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 we're going. Are you part of the community? I love the setup of this place because it's community friendly. We have great building plans where, where we're at in Monument and this huge auditorium about two, three years ago, they drew the plans and, and it had all of the chairs all in perfect order coming down to the very front where the pulpit was and the chairs were anchored in. I finally convinced them to say that's not community friendly. We need a place where you can take the chairs and get them out when something's going on in the community and they want to come in and use the building. We want to be the center of community, the place where they know they go and they can see why and, and the school, being involved with the schools to, to help in any way that we can. I meet with preachers of, of other churches monthly uh, to pray, just to pray. And, and I know instantly it draws a red flag. And maybe even the mention with some is I say, listen, I meet with all the area ministers, pastors, preachers from that area once a month for coffee. And we pray for one another. And I have had some that says, you meet with the denominational people. I said, yeah, we pray. We have coffee. And we get into our personal lives and pray for that. We don't get into any doctrinal things, but we pray a lot. And I said, we're here to serve. We're here to love on people. To say, we're here to make a difference. Are you here to make a point or are you here to make a difference? We want to be the church that, that makes a difference. I, I, I pray and, and also I take a time out on that whole thing anyway because it's my soapbox. The denominations, oh, the denominations. When I think of the greatest awe, amazing story that applies to us, when you read in Acts chapter 2, that day, when that spirit came down and all came upon every soul, they were all Jews, every last one of them. Now, I know that we take the story and, and, and have taken it and said, oh, listen, this comes back to us. And I'm saying, listen, if you do the math and read the text, you will find, no. Is anyone in here Jewish? Okay, I'll move on. We are what then? We're Gentiles. I got some bad news. Acts chapter 2, yeah, we're not in there. We're going to come along over there when Peter goes into the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. And that's when all us Gentiles should jump and say, yay, it's, it's our turn. And he goes in and he tells him what? According to our law, we're not even supposed to have anything to do with you Gentiles. But God... God sent me. And he talked to them, and, and through that talk and the things that happened, the next thing you know, the Holy Spirit came down upon the Gentiles. And guess what? They started doing the exact same thing that the Jews did back in Jerusalem. And the message was given, hey, if it's on them, hey, what are we going to do? And it wasn't until later, and if you remember Romans chapter 11, we get the whole story of our part when we get entered in, Gentiles. Romans 11, he says, listen, what happened was God's chosen people, the Jews, they were pretty ignorant. They were proud and arrogant and thought they were the ones that would judge people. And so God says, hold on right there. Hey, Gentiles, come on over. Come on in, everyone, come on. And he tells us in Romans 11, 11, 
that salvation came to the Gentiles to make his people jealous. How do you like being used? <laughs> I, I taught that in a class one time, and I, one person, I don't feel comfortable being, like, I feel like I'm being used. And I said, well, how can, how can you not be, are you uncomfortable? And I said, he included us in, thank you, I'll take it. He says, you come on in. I got a place for you, a branch. It's your branch. But listen, don't you dare. Don't you dare ever be arrogant and filled with pride and look down on the other branches. Because just like I broke the branch of my own people, I'll break your branch too. Come on in, he says. I'm your God. I love you. And I love you the same way that I love my own people. But now we're family. Acts chapter 15 comes along and they have to go to the Jerusalem council because it gets the message out while they're preaching the, the good news. It comes on the Gentiles and the Gentiles want to be part of the family. So what do they do? That's the problem. The Jews said, listen, if they're going to be a part, then they're going to be just like us in every way. They're going to be circumcised. They're going to follow the law, the custom of Moses. They're going to follow everything just like us. Then they can come in. But then there was an argument. They said, no, wait, that's not what God said. So they had to go back to Jerusalem, to the council. And now we don't have headquarters or anything like that. They went back to Jerusalem, to the council, to sit down and say, what are we going to do with these Gentiles? Unless they're circumcised, they cannot be saved. And they had, to, they had, a, had a mess. And then what? They decided, they said, here's what's going to happen. We can't bind on them the covenant relationship that we have with God. We're not going to do it. Nah. Here's what you do. Four things. He said, don't, don't, don't eat meat from strangled animals. Would you please stop being sexually immoral? Would you stay away from blood? And would you not eat food sacrificed to idols? Sure. That's us. Awe. Oh, if that doesn't fill you with awe, that that's your part in the story, what can? That's an amazing story. And yet we, we come tonight, as we finish up here, and the only question that I ask then is, how does it ever happen that we get together and many times when we speak of things dealing with other people that believe in God but are also different, that it causes fights and arguments and divisions. I, I got called out on it one time early on because I referred to uh, those guys that I meet with as brothers. Little did they know that when we first met, we went around the table and introduced each other. And I was shocked. Every story. What's your story of faith? How did it begin? Well, I was this old. I felt called by God to do this. I felt convicted of my sin. I was immersed in baptism for the remission of my sins and to surrender it all to God. And I said, wow. We moved on. So I'm saying, brother... It gets challenged, and they said, no, no, they, they're doing things wrong. They're, just, they're not doing things right over there. They have rock bands, and they have women doing this, and they do this stuff, and they have food in the, in the auditorium. You don't have food. I want to start a lottery. Who's going to make the first stain in your new auditorium? <laughs> I would make a little simple proposal. Go get a cup of coffee and come in and just throw it right on the floor and be done with it and move on. <laughs> We, we have this situation where I'm from, and trust me, it's, it's coming. But what do I say? I say, listen, in awe, awe comes upon every one of us. As I think about that and being called out on, on referring to someone as brothers, and here's the most shocking thing. I said, sometimes if you just do a little common sense, a little logic, it will work itself out. I said, listen, what happens, and it's been going on here at the church where I am. You want to talk about amazing stories. We change the approach of, you know, we're talking about Jesus. And we have people every week coming from the community. And the most amazing thing to me is we're now becoming more of a church that has no idea what the old Church of Christ history is all about. I can't use the funny stories anymore. A 728B, 
No, they don't have any idea what I'm talking about. The only ones going to heaven, pfft, they don't know anything about that. And also, by the way, instrumental music, they don't care. They really don't. They'll come up sometimes and they say, there's something different. I says, yeah. And what is it? I says, well, you don't have instruments. I said, no. Well, why not? Well, why would we? <laughs> well, it sounds good. So we, uh, <laughs> they come in and we've had people actually with experience of acapella singing that have never been in a church of Christ. And we have folks that come up, they've come up to me afterwards and said, listen, and they have a songbook in their hand. And they say, preacher, how much do these cost? Because I'm going to take this home and I'm going to learn it because this is the best I've ever heard. And I said, 20 bucks. And I said, you, I didn't take it take it and come on back they have no idea that thrills me the most because to me someone is coming into a place where we have our tradition I don't have a problem with tradition unless it becomes your law and I can tell you with all confidence neither does anyone coming in unless you make an issue of it how many times when you're describing your church on, on, on ads or brochures or websites or whatever you say well we don't believe this what is that kind of a thing how, don't, how come we don't start by saying here's what we believe you start by saying well we don't you know the instrumental music I said listen we sing a cappella because there's nothing better okay we go on and people come in they have no idea and no background from the prison ministry I remember some of the challenges when we stopped doing all the things about protecting identity and the like and just elevating Jesus and since that time, just in this past year, we've had three or four different baptisms that were beyond all amazing. Uh, we had an 85-year-old man who I believe was almost 60 years anniversary with his wife. Uh, the one of the nicest guys, never been baptized. All of a sudden, through just conversation and just simple preaching, elevating Jesus, and he comes up and says, I'm getting baptized. Now, you may not think that that's so amazing. The amazing part, his wife, when he got married some 60 years, the daughter of a Church of Christ minister. Amazing. What was missing and what changed the awe? I know that you don't have to look far. Uh, the most important part as I look for an awe level is absolute humility. God warned when he told them about the branch, us Gentiles. Oh, he picked a great group of people to accomplish his purpose. You want to make your chosen people jealous? Hello, goofy Gentiles. We'll do it. Are we gonna, are you going to do church on Saturday? Nope. We're Gentiles. Don't have to. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna do this uh, uh, celebration feast on this day and uh, no We're Gentiles you don't have to we do a great job of making his chosen people jealous but they got the message they said oh Lord please we're sorry not the Gentiles don't let the dogs in no God please no we're sorry and God says I will show mercy on whom I choose to show mercy come on in here we are today. Where's our humility? He said, don't you dare be arrogant and don't be filled with pride and start looking down on all these other branches. Hmm. Do we have branches in our communities today that we're looking down upon perhaps? What's the awe level? A final question. You guys working toward being an asterisk-free church? An asterisk free church. The world needs more asterisk free churches. What's an asterisk free? You put it on your sign. A place to call home. People might actually buy into that from the community and once they get in the doors they may get a different story. They may say, oh, there was an asterisk that I missed. The fine print that says, yeah, it's a place to call home unless you're from this place, this place, this place, or this place. And then you can visit, but then you got to go. An asterisk for your home. Sinners are welcome. 
Really? Is that asterisk free? Or is there an asterisk attached to it that you say, sinners are welcome unless your sin is this one, this one, or this one, and then we can't have you. Asterisk free. Where the saints meet. That used to be on a lot of signs. And yet you walk in and what do you hear? What's the message is geared toward? The lost. If I want to know what other churches believe, I'm going to go there because at least I know it'll be a reliable source that I'm learning from. I don't need to hear it when I'm gathered with the saints in awe of our living God. All of these things to be an asterisk-free church. I know there are many challenges that exist. The prison ministry, man, it was filled with things that rocked my world. I remember one night going in, a couple of weeks of Bible studies, and, and there's this inmate that comes over, and he takes the chair, and he puts it over in the corner, and he gets up on it and sits on it. And doesn't say a word the whole class, ever. He just sits there. And I finish, and then he gets down off the chair, and off he goes. Two or three weeks that happened. About the third, one of the other guys says, Preacher, that's got to go. I said, what's the problem? It, it's a distraction to the word. I said, what's the distraction? He's not saying anything. I said, what is he doing? He says, he believes completely that he's an owl. <laughs> and I thought, an owl, that's different. Well, what's the problem? He thinks he's an owl. He's got to go. And I said, let me tell you something. Everybody's welcome here. And I said, and besides that, he's not distracting. He's not interrupting anything he doesn't say. And ever since I've been here, I've not seen one mouse. <laughs> he was done. He was done. Baptism services at the prison were amazing all the way up through Canyon City. But there's a challenge there. They have portable baptistries where you put the guys down and it's only about that much water. They lean back and then come up. It's not like a full tank. One particular night, there's this guy who is much bigger than I am, believe it or not. It can happen. And he was so excited to be baptized. And we got him down and he sat down. And then I, I laid him back under that water and his face went all the way under. But this part here <laughs> was this high above the water. I look around and I see the eyes of the guys who I know are watching to make sure it's valid. <laughs> what do you do? I looked and he's still under there and I'm thinking, I'm saying, how long can he hold his breath while I decide? And I just started splashing and said, welcome, brother. What are you going to do? It's the best that we could do at the time. But I know that there are people. I've heard this one. And trust me, I will confess it right now. I've had those folks saying, listen, that lady that you just got through baptizing, this part of the hair was up. It didn't go. It didn't go. It didn't go. Okay. You know now, I've confessed to you, because when you get to heaven, I can't because I've messed up so many baptisms. <laughs> when you see the folks walking around with half the side of the hair gone and half the, the hand gone, it's Smith, that was Smith. We, he told us about that. That was his mess up. Or you can say, listen, either we believe that you are saved by faith and not by how the preacher does the baptism. Or you're going to have to change your whole belief. Church 2, verses, what's your awe level? I will pray to God for an awe level that is so humble and so simple that from 1 Corinthians 14, that when we gather in awe to the living God, that when an unbeliever would happen to walk in and just sit down, that just an observation of how we respond to the incredible God who created all things and the awe that we exhibit in our worship and our praise to Him that that unbeliever who just happened by without us telling them 25 ways they're going to hell, they can look one part of us and what we're doing, take one glimpse and say, surely God is among you and fall to their knees and say, I want in. That's all. The response of all. In your Bible, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. 
listening to God's plan and everything that we're to do as a result of all. And then comes the two most terrifying words that I believe can be said to any church today. He says in verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need. God will provide everything you need. And godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He's given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Oh and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. All right, now what? For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities, here it comes, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of your Lord Jesus Christ. Oh. Let those words sink in, church. May it never be. May it never be. The two words to describe the all level ineffective and unproductive. And the only way, the only way that you can avoid that, that we can avoid that, is to make certain when we gather that we acknowledge and we exhibit all. God bless you, church. Thanks for having me out.